So my name is Chauncey Shiloh. I am an associate pastor at Christ Community Church in South Oklahoma City. So where we are right now is right here at um, Broadway and Commerce Street. So this area, so the, the, the block is I-44 down to 240, up 35 to 40. And this is the 22 square miles that is the, the south side, the southwest Oklahoma City. Chauncey isn't from Oklahoma. He moved here years ago and is raising a family. He has spent time learning the history of the city to better serve the residents of his district. Christ Community Church is just one of many organizations in Oklahoma City. Their free medical clinic, community center, and shelter address issues in the southwest section, which are prevalent in other quadrants of OKC and across Oklahoma in general. Oklahoma is known for its diversity in ecosystems, from pine-covered mountains to prairies to cypress swamps. Its biodiversity allows for boating, fishing, camping, hiking, and even spelunking. It's a state rich in Native American culture, as well as vast, deep oil. All of this is set against the struggles that Oklahoma faces. The poverty line in the state of Oklahoma is $24,000 annually. It is reported to affect about 22% of the state's population, while the national average is only 14%. Compounding this is the rate of homelessness in the state. In 2013, there were more than 44,000 children who suffered from homelessness. As comparison, Kansas had only 18,000, and Nebraska had only 6,400 children living without homes. Furthering their struggle, the state's education system is in flux. It ranks 40th in the country for high school. And in 2015, it was reported that Oklahoma ranked 48th in overall education quality. Recently, Oklahoma City, its capital and the state's largest, has faced $30 million in budget cuts in the last two years, leaving public schools to scrape together their own money for textbooks. Well, Oklahoma City Public Schools says it is at critical mass when it comes to education funding. Today, it rolled out the latest plan to get more funding, and it means playing hardball with lawmakers. On Monday, August 21st, the board will consider a resolution instructing the district's legal counsel and appropriate staff to begin the process of interviewing law firms in order to prepare a lawsuit or lawsuits against the Oklahoma legislature. Oklahoma's legislative leadership has failed at their constitutional responsibility to provide textbooks for every child and their moral responsibility to put Oklahoma's children and their education first. Legislative leaders are now sounding off House Speaker Charles McCall. The Oklahoma City Public School District needs to stop playing political games and get back to educating students. And Senate Pro Tem Mike Scholl says this is merely a media stunt by the Oklahoma City Public School District. In April of 2018, schools across the state closed for two weeks as teachers and supporters in the tens of thousands marched on the Capitol to lobby for educational funding. With state legislature against the public school system and politics, who are the ones to really suffer? Since 2008, though spending by state per student has increased in many states, the state of Oklahoma is currently spending 15% less per student. With educational funding tied up in red tape, community leaders and organizations across Oklahoma City have decided to stop waiting for legislation and start working towards eliciting change within their own neighborhoods. Dr. Nancy Snow, the director of the Institute for the Study of Human Flourishing, touches on this in her work at the University of Oklahoma. The Institute is an interesting combination of academics and real-world community outreach. So our mission is threefold, to promote virtue and flourishing in OU students, to promote the study and science of virtue and flourishing, and to promote the flourishing of all Oklahomans. As a professor of philosophy for more than 30 years, her focus has been on moral psychology and virtue ethics. Her passion led her to the Institute as a way to apply her philosophy to real life. The Institute is helping to address two big problems in Oklahoma. Number one, the social problems in the state. And number two, the problem of academic research not making meaningful changes at the local level. 
before I arrived in Oklahoma. I received an email from the principal of Norman High, Dr. Scott Beck. Scott Beck is very, very interested in character development and human flourishing. I think immediately I uh, started talking about potential outreach and how the Institute's work and our work here um, you know, might connect on some levels. And they have done work uh, on their mission. Our school mission is, we have three words, very right. simple, sure. and uh, so citizenship, scholarship, and character. They've done work integrating that into their classrooms. Citizenship, uh, this idea that I'm part of something bigger than myself, that I'm contributing to a greater cause. Uh, scholarship, um, addressing the academic nature and what it means to be a scholar and what it means to have curiosity and learn and a love for learning. And then of course the character piece. So this is a fundamental part of our work, right? As in terms of work that we've done with, uh, with the Institute, Dr. Snow has addressed our faculty on the topic of character. This summer, the Institute uh, actually hosted uh, a week-long training for teachers, uh, talking about character, talking about character strengths and, and, and beyond. They've taken advantage of the things the Institute has to offer. They were our first partner high school. Our first two days of school orientation with our students, a significant portion of that time was spent in that work where every kid is, you know, we're talking about exemplar uh, theory and we're talking about, um, you know, virtues and we're talking about character strengths and what do these things look like and who's a, who's a great example of humility and, you know, who is an exemplar of, um, of, of, of kindness, right? So uh, these are uh, a lot of the a lot of the work that we've done with the institute. You know, has stem stem from that training. The principles of the institute are derived from an effort to be a bridge between academia and the local community. The institute's philosophy of how to help schools teach character starts from the assumption that good teachers already teach virtue. Since virtues are necessary for being a good student and a good member of the educational community, they use academic training and resources to help raise conscious awareness for the teachers, give them virtue terminology and concepts, and support their professional development with learning in the brain conferences, and in some cases, academic life coaching, to improve what they're already doing. This establishes a culture of virtue that grows organically from the school's own culture, rather than handing them a pre-developed program like a barnacle added on to their existing work. It's easy for me to say every good teacher teaches character, but to do that and to think through it in a more intentional way. I absolutely believe that my entire career I have done this. I also absolutely know I can do better. And thinking through what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. The word intentionality has always been important for me. In the last few years, it's been crucial. Using the talents of our postdoctoral uh, fellow, Dr. Michael Warren. We are doing assessments of how well we are meeting our goals with respect to character development and implementation of other goals, such as flourishing. So we've been partnering with um, Lieutenant Cubitt from the Oklahoma City Police Department, and he runs a, uh, a program called FACT. I mean, FACT stands for Family Awareness and Community Teamwork. It's a uh, gang prevention program. It originally started as a gang prevention program. It's kind of morphed into a mentoring program where four police officers walk, uh, work in plain clothes full time as mentors in the community to inner city kids. The portion that I came in with, uh, to help run assessments and evaluations on was uh, uh, one little part of fact, which is called movie night. And this involves once weekly meetings where um, kids between ages 10 and 19, might be 18, uh, come into one of the community centers and they have some games to play, so there's some socialization, things of this sort, but then they, they all share a meal together. And then towards the end, there's about a maybe 45 minute long character lesson. We see the kids uh, getting better and better in their character, we see it but we don't have any tangible thing uh, uh, to show for it. We don't have any data to, to show for it. 
And so the Institute uh, offered a partnership with us to come in and talk to our kids and, and uh, survey our kids and, and survey our parents and our, and our officers to figure out you know, exactly what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And if, if in fact, we're actually having any kind of effect on their character, their, their personal virtues at all. And so it's been fabulous that they've taken an interest in our work and it's been fabulous to show us that what we're doing uh, actually makes a difference in the, in the lives, not only of our kids, but ultimately our community. We interviewed uh, the students, the, the kids, um, some of their parents, and some of the police officers. And kind of a sampling of, of our findings are that amongst the kids, those who have been involved with the FACT program, the Movie Night FACT program longer, um, report higher uh, character across our nine different virtues that our institute supports. Uh, what we have to do uh, is we have to increase the number of good options they have. Make it more difficult for them to make a bad choice. You know, uh, fit camp out there, we have 30 kids, man. Y'all use the stuff? Yeah. Y'all did? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was good. It was real good. It worked out. And uh, so inner city has a lot of bad choices. What we have to do before they get there is we have to try to eliminate the bad options, right? That's an adult thing. That's not a kid thing. And so uh, when, when I see bad options for kids, I, I, I try to eliminate it, not only for, for that kid, but for the community. The Institute focuses on nine virtues. These include the intellectual virtues of love of learning, intellectual humility, and open-mindedness, the executive virtues of self-regulation, perseverance, and honesty, and the civic virtues of civility, compassion, and fairness. In trying to make changes in communities, the aim is to instill these virtues in youth to guide Oklahoma City on a path towards being a healthier and flourishing city in the future. The Institute hosts a camp over spring break for OU students to learn about virtues and flourishing, ultimately impacting homelessness and poverty while focusing on personal and individual growth. Where we have seen the most success is our Camp Impact. Uh, we spend a day looking at the theoretical side of virtue and what it is. Uh, then we spend a day doing service um, at a local homeless uh, shelter here in Oklahoma City. Uh, we also had students go to the Capitol, um, look at civic virtue in those ways as well. The feedback that we got from the students, uh, the changes that we saw in the students, the follow-up that we've done with these students to really um, learn that in three days you can make an impact on students uh, by presenting the material, having them practice um, what they've learned um, in this setting and just continuing to reinforce that. In order to understand how much the students demonstrate and incorporate the virtues from camp into daily life, the Institute follows the campers with assessment and gatherings over time. Um, I think what camp gave me is just a sense of consciousness, um, really being able to sit down and look at myself and my interactions with people and evaluating whether or not I'm interacting or whether or not I'm being the person I want to be, whether I'm being as honest as possible and straightforward, or if I'm regulating my thoughts and my actions and making sure that I'm mindful of other people, um, all the way to just being compassionate and understanding that everyone's going through different things and understanding that my path isn't the only path. Um, so just being conscious about everything that's happening in the world around me and conscious that's happening within my mind, um, I think that's the way that camp is impacting me the most. Camp, as you guys remember, made us all take a look at our own character so we could serve others. All of our impact statements mean something to us, and, and I challenge everyone to stay on top of that goal. By all the blank expressions, I kind of figured maybe we might have forgotten about our impact statements. So uh, I do challenge us to stay on top of it, because I know that personally I fell off the wagon as well, and I've even stopped working on my lowest virtue, self-regulation. Like with self-regulation, that was my lowest virtue, and that's still pretty hard, because uh, finals and just everything, just like, you know, college, it just starts eating away at you, and sometimes it's hard to remember the things that you do learn, but with another, with other stuff like compassion, honesty, open-mindedness, with those, I've been working on them, and I can see myself getting better. There's a Latin phrase that I am in love with and it's in my Instagram bio. 
is sic parvis magna, which means thus from small things comes greatness. Sometimes it begins with something small. You don't have to take big steps to fulfill your impact statement. So I challenge everyone to go home or go back to the dorms and reread your statement and don't forget about it. Change it if you need to. If you need support for your statement, just look around you because we're all here to support you. We're all here to lean on and we are all family. Thank you. To extend the bridge between academia and community, the Institute also aids an existing summer camp for youth in teaching virtue. Shiloh is a uh, day camp in the middle of the city where we serve 500 to 700 city kids every summer. They are outdoors, they are getting to do things that they wouldn't normally do. They uh, fish, they canoe, they mountain bike, they do crafts and dance and choir and drama. We'll talk about honesty, love of learning, perseverance, mm -hmm. and Self-regulation. Self-regulation, which we call self-control, just for the sake of simplicity. And so they will hear different speakers speak on that. It will be ministry and marketplace leaders so that they can have top-level instruction. And then we'll have um, great team building and bonding and fun stuff. But then they will also identify a way that they'd like to impact the city. A lot of times um, the perspective of youth is that they are just to be receivers. They're constantly given instruction and direction and critique and um, we want to um, hear them and we want to give them a chance for their voices to be heard. We want to give them a chance for them to um, impact their city because they're capable of doing it. In spite of being young, youth is not a, um, a liability. Right. That they can come up with creative ideas and solutions to the problems of their city um, with compassion and um, excellence. As the city and its people continue to struggle, some groups like Salt and Light Leadership Training aim to initiate an action-oriented movement. Working with the Institute allows for forward motion as they can apply an academic foundation instead of the organization starting from square one. Well, we've asked a couple of, of sort of broad questions along the way. Uh, for example, what if Oklahoma City were the best place in the country to raise a child? What would that look like? If we ask questions not about our natural resources being gas or oil or an NBA team, uh, but about our children, could we transform the communities that we, that we live in and where our kids live? Um, and, I, and I guess the more fundamental and present question is, is are our children healthy in Oklahoma City? Are they well, is the question we're asking. Looking at poverty, homelessness, and education, are the children of Oklahoma City well? Are they flourishing in the face of budget cuts, crisis, and adversity? All too often, we outsource the issue, and we say, Poverty is the issue that such and such organization over here in this corner of the city is working on. Homelessness is the issue that such and such in this corner of the city is working on. And we don't own the responsibility, the personal individual, my family's responsibility to care for these people. The Institute also focuses its efforts on working with community leaders through training, presentations, and symposia. Their work with SALT developed into a three-day conference called How Are the Children, geared toward tackling practical issues specific to individual neighborhoods, such as developing neighborhood green space, to guiding neighborhoods through the process of obtaining sidewalks for children to get to school. How Are the Children uh, is kind of a long title for an initiative, but where it came from is a story uh, and the story is from the Maasai Mara tribe. It's a warrior tribe in Africa, in Kenya. And when warriors greet each other, they don't say, hello, how are you, in, in their language. They say, Kazirian Erga. And what that means is, how are the children? So for them, for these warriors, the most important thing for the measurement of the health of their communities, for their villages, is how the children are. And I think that teaching point is something that our culture is kind of clueless about. 
And what I love about this conference is that it's bringing together scholars in the field and it's bringing together you know, the practitioners and the leaders who are on the front lines. And they're coming together and they're, they're really talking. Uh, you know, that, that the scholars are presenting uh, frameworks, they're presenting uh, tools, they're presenting, um, you know, ways to go about, you know, engaging and transforming institutions and individuals where the ones on the front lines are bringing challenges. They're bringing uh, their lived experience. And I think together as they talk through what are, you know, not only the broader vision, but also what are the concrete next steps, right? Like where's the next place that we're gonna go? What is the next kind of burgeoning opportunity that we can take advantage of? And what do we need to get there? Um, that, that that has been an inspirational collaboration to, to witness and to, to be a part of. SALT embodies the ideas and the energy for creating change, but also suffers from the challenges local organizations face when trying to initiate solutions. How do we address children in despair? But how do we do it in, in such a comprehensive manner that we're actually effective? And also, how do we not do it in this instant gratification way, but, but look at what's the 20-year plan? What is the long-term strategy recognizing some of us won't even live to see the outcome, but we're committed to the process. As Oklahoma continues to suffer from having some of the highest numbers of families without food in the country, and as their rate of poverty continues to outpace the national average, questions still remain. What steps can be taken in the city to make sure the resources that are available get to the organizations that can use them? When I was a teacher at Santa Fe South for 10 years, I taught high school theater, English, got a chance to see deeply into kids' lives. When they're writing papers for you and they're, they're doing monologues they wrote for themselves, you get to see deeper into their lives. And the family brokenness um, is um, even more astounding than the poverty. And so when, you've, you, know, when you have 9,000 children in foster care, the issue isn't poverty, the issue is family. And the issue is um, care and relationship and commitment and covenant and all those biblical ideals. Um, so I think if we take care of some of those issues, I think the poverty and the homeless will take care of itself. So here we have a desire to really come uh, to have this uh, a heightened strategic impact. We have now several hundred people that have been a part of SALT. These, these are people now that are on the same page with a view of, of the city and how do we be purposeful about that. But what we, what we really were wanting also was to be very strategic and craft uh, 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 something of a plan that we could call others into this vision. But that really requires metrics and it requires uh, being able to partner up with, with folks who, who really come at it with that alongside. So the first question we ask is how can we help? How can we partner up in a way that fulfills our mission and the remit of our funding, but helps you do what you need to do? So here's the Institute, uh, and they're engaged in the, the study of human flourishing, and they have associations with other individuals who are very specific in what this looks like and can actually get, help give us a roadmap uh, because there's no point in us reinventing the wheel. Oklahoma City could become the most beautiful vision of itself. It could become the most beautiful vision of itself, not just for some people, but for everybody who lives here. That can actually happen. Cities are built, they are destroyed, and they can be rebuilt by normal folk. That's how it works. I think that is amazing. Somebody built all this. Somebody can heal it, why not you?